Okay, um, we'll begin the class. Thank you all for attending those who are uh, those who are listening. Uh, thank you for thank you for listening. Uh, today we are going to speak about a very important oh, you can't hear me. Oh my. Oh, okay. Okay, you can hear me now. Very good. So, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Srila Prabhupada's translation and purport to uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, verse uh, 343, Canto 3, Chapter 4, verse 3. So, um, first I will um, read that verse. Bhagavan Swatma Maya Ya Gatim Tam Gatim Tam of Alokya Saha Saraswati Mupas Prisha Vriksha Mula Mupa Vishat. Prabhupada's translation. The personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna, after foreseeing the end of his family, by his internal potency, went to the bank of the river Saraswati, sipped water, and sat down underneath a tree literally sat at the root of a tree. So, um, Uddhava, Lord Krishna's great devotee Uddhava is speaking. And this is a very, um, how should I put it, delicate or very sensitive uh, portion of the Bhagavatam because it involves Lord Krishna's disappearance from this world. And of course, just as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Janma Karma Cha Me Divyam Evam Jyoveti Tatvata, one who understands my birth and activities in this world, uh, Tatvataha, in truth, in, literally in categorical truth. In other words, you know that Krishna does not appear in a material body. Krishna does not take birth in this world the way an ordinary person takes birth in this world. So in that sense, uh, one who understands my birth and activities in, according to tattva, that I'm Vishnu tattva, I'm not Jiva tattva, that my body is made out of spiritual energy, it is not Mahamaya and so on. And so similarly, Krishna's disappearance, because it's just like takeoff and landing are the most dangerous parts of a flight. So Krishna's so to speak, his takeoff, his appearance in this world, and then his departure, like the beginning of Krishna's activities here in the end, are the most dangerous, uh, or how should I put it, these are the aspects of Krishna's pastimes that one might most easily misunderstand. And that's why this particular portion of the Bhagavatam is so important to understand properly how Krishna leaves this world in the same spiritual way that he comes into it. So to give you some context here, Uddhava is speaking and in the previous verse he says that Teshang Maideya Doshena Vishami Krita Cheta Sang Nim Locha Tiruvavasi Venu Nam Ivamardana that um, there was a slaughter, there was a destruction uh, of the Yaru dynasty. Uh, and he says here, Uddhava Maireya Doshena, by the fault, by the mistake, or by the imperfection, the flaw of Maireya, uh, intoxication or liquor. And by this liquor, uh, these great devotees became Vishami Krita Chaitasa, which means their Chaitas, their consciousness, uh, Krita became, or was transformed into, became, a, or was made Vishami Sama in Sanskrit means equal or levels. The English word same, sama. And Krishna says, for example, samoham sarva bhuteshu, I am equal to all living beings. Lord Krishna also says, uh, samak sarvechu bhuteshu madhaktim labate param. One attains the highest stage of devotional service when one is equal to all living entities. Similarly, a, a, a true pundit, pandita samadarshana, that the true why, those who are actually wise, 
see all living beings, Bidya, Bina, Sampane, Brahmane, a learned and gentle Brahman, a, uh, a cow, an elephant, a dog eater, a dog, and so on, sees them all equally. Sama, are, again, the same word, Sama. So to say not equal, in other words, not smooth, not even, not equal, not the way it should be, is Vishama. Not Sama, but Vishama. Uh, just like V karma means bad karma, so V shama. And Lord Chaitanya in his Shikshastika verse says, V shame bhavam bhutau. Kripa, yeah, that, uh, taking the part of a conditioned soul that I'm fallen into this uh, ocean, literally this ocean of, of appearances, of becoming and disappearing, I, and uh, this material ocean, which is V shama. It is not smooth or equal or even or, or in other words, things aren't going the way they should. It's rough, it's uh, troublesome and so on. So, and, and Vishami literally means unequal. So a devotee is supposed to see Krishna everywhere. A devotee should evaluate every action in terms of its, that actions being favorable or unfavorable for Krishna's service. So when we lose that, that equal vision of seeing all living beings spiritually and thereby respecting all living beings, not wanting to exploit any living being, not becoming materially attached, not hating anyone, and seeing everything, every object equally as meant to be used in Krishna's service. When we lose that equal vision, we, we have vishama chaitas, consciousness, unequal consciousness. And that's exactly what happened to the Yadu dynasty, according to Dava, by this fall down, which was really just Krishna's arrangement anyway. But by this fault of, of liquor, of intoxication, their uh, Vishamikrita Chaita song, their consciousness became Vishamikrita. It became, uh, they lost that spiritual vision. And then Nim Lo Vasit. And then when the sun set, and of course, as we know, Krishna, uh, Purana Arako, the Bhagavatam is compared to the sun, Krishna is compared to the sun, and, and so when the sun sets, it means that our, the knowledge is vanishing and Krishna is leaving this world, the sun symbolizing all these things, knowledge and, and the light that Krishna brings to this world. So having said that, to give you some context, uh, Krishna, or Uddhava, the great devotee Uddhava then says, Bhagavan Swatva Mayaya Gatin Tam of Alokya Sa. It's very interesting. Krishna observing of Alokya, observing the Gati. Uh, gati in Sanskrit means literally the going. The English word go is Sanskrit ga or gum. And here the word Gati, the going or the way, the path. Here Prabhupada translates it the end. So gati can mean the goal or end in the sense of like it's a going that ends up somewhere. So uh, so he saw that movement or that conclusion of his own his own Maya. That means that Krishna empowered Atma Maya, his own illusory potency, or which I mean, illusory in the sense of being Mahamaya or Yoga Maya in this case, because in both cases there's an illusion. The difference is that Yoga Maya creates an illusion that increases our Krishna consciousness, as for example, Yashoda falsely believing that she's actually Krishna's mother. But in terms of bhakti, in terms of pure love, in terms of rasa, yes, she is Krishna's mother. But technically, Krishna has no mother, he's God. He's the Adi Purusha, the original person. So, so yoga maya creates an illusion that it increases our Krishna consciousness, whereas Mahamaya creates an illusion which decreases our Krishna consciousness. That's the difference. So Krishna had set in motion, he had empowered his, 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 that potency of his to arrange things in a certain way and having set it in motion, he now literally sits back and observes how it's moving toward a certain end. And that end, of course, will be that he will leave this world. Another point here in this verse is Saraswati Upasprisha. 
A sprish in Sanskrit means to touch, literally. An upa sprisha, like a little touch. And sort of uh, uh, touching a little the saraswati. This word upa sprisha is used all the time in the Bhagavatam in the sense of what we now call achman. Uh, where you, for example, there's a little cup with a little spoon, you put some water in your hand to purify your hands, or you sprinkle other parts of your, your body to ritually purify them. I mean, three drops of water, if your hands are really dirty, three drops of water won't do it. But this is sort of a sacred purification, so it's understood you're coming into a, a, a state of spiritual purity. And so what's interesting here is that Krishna is about to sit down, Briksha Mula, Mula of course means root. He's about, he, he said he sat down at, at, at the root of a tree, which as Prabhupada says, beneath the tree, or in the, in the synonyms at the foot of a tree. So Krishna, as he explains in Bhagavad Gita, comes to this world, Dharma Sangstapanartaya, for the purpose of restoring Dharma. And he says, Utsi Deyuri Me Loka Nakuriyam Karma Chedaham in chapter 3 of the Gita that if I did not perform the standard duties then I, all the worlds would be ruined because people would follow my example after all yajada charity shastas whatever the best person does other people follow so even here at the very end when Krishna is supposedly alone Udava admits in, in another verse coming up that Krishna told him go to Badarik Ashrama but feeling separation Udava kind of didn't go immediately he followed Krishna. So it's just Krishna and Udava. Udava is already a liberated soul, obviously. And, and yet Krishna is still performing these, even down to details, he's performing the religious duties, the dharma of ordinary people because he's doing Saraswati Musprisha. He's ritually purifying himself. That, that's how the word's always used. So he's still, because when one sits down, and obviously he's going to deeply meditate on his departure from this world. So when one sits down for spiritual concentration, one does achman and Krishna does it. So at this point he's still doing it. And it would shows how diligent he is, how conscientious, how much he really cares about us and how serious he is about setting a good example for us. Um, and then in the next verse, just to again, frame the verse we're talking about to give you the context. Udava says, Aham chokto bhagavata prapanarati harenaha vadaring twang prayahiti sakulang sanjahirsuna. So the Lord who takes away the suffering of those who surrender to him, and that Lord who sakulang sanjahirsuna, uh, who desired to remove his own family, Swakulang Sanjayirsuna, uh, told me, Badarin Twang Priyahi, go now, go to Badari, Badari Kashrama. But of course, Udava says that, Tatapi, even so, Tatapi, even so, Tadabi Pratam Jana, knowing Krishna's purpose that he's going to leave this world. I followed my master from behind. Padavishlesh and Akshama, which means I was unable to let go of his feet, of my master's feet. So, I also want to talk here about uh, this point that Krishna is withdrawing his dynasty because that's also that's also very important here krishna is withdrawing his dynasty so what's going on why did he cause this fratricidal slaughter you'd have to say that's the word used mardanum why did krishna do it that way i mean why did he remove them uh there is a good reason consider this for example Let's say that in the city where you live, there is some kind of organized criminal activity, it could be terrorist activity actually, where uh, the threat or the problem uh, is too big for the local police to handle. They actually can't deal with it. 
in, in other words, the city is, is out of control because of the magnitude of the attack by a criminal organization or, or a terrorist organization. So at that point, uh, the mayor of the city gets on the phone, calls the governor, and asks for the National Guard, the, the State Guard, to come in. And if that doesn't work, that they'll, and if, it's, if the threat is really serious, of course, they'll send in federal troops. Not only the FBI and other such groups, but they'll actually send in the Army or the Armed Forces if the threat is actually big enough. It's actually an invasion. But once that, situ once that situation has been resolved once the federal forces have restored law and order and there's no longer a threat, the federal troops or the state troops have to leave the city because under ordinary circumstances you can't have federal troops you know, walking around with machine guns on the streets of our cities in a civil society. So something exactly analogous happened on the earth in the sense that um, Mahavarata stresses over and over again, the Bhagavatam explains over and over again, that 5,000 years ago, the Asuras, great Asuras, uh, invaded the earth and were taken over the earth by uh, taking birth as, in, taking birth in the most powerful royal dynasties. So, so in that sense, the story of Krishna's uh, descent to this world, the Mahabharata story or 10th canto, actually begins in the Bhagavatam, eighth canto, when there's a great sort of cosmic battle between the demigods and the asuras, the demigods ultimately win, and the asuras regroup and decide to create a, a, an insurgency. They go to Earth and um, they take birth in the greatest dynasties. For example, one of the most powerful Danavas, actually the the, the, the leader of the Danavas. Viprachiti takes birth as Jarasandha, and, and by doing that he takes over the powerful dynasty which originated in Chedi. That's a whole story which is explained in Mahabharata, how uh, several generations, several generations before Krishna, uh, Indra personally made the king of Chedi, King Vasu, the emperor of the world, not a Kuru king, it was Chedi, uh, Chedi Rod, the, the king of Chedi Vasu, and that family was the most powerful uh, royal family on earth at the time and they were supposed to protect the earth from the demons who were starting to come to earth. And so then Viprachiti, this great Dhanava, actually took birth in that family, took over the dynasty. Similarly, the Yadu dynasty, uh, when, when, Brahma, when Bhumi, the earth goddess, goes to Brahma and tells her that I can't deal with this situation because she's been invaded by these extraterrestrial asuras, these powerful asuras, then Krishna tells the demigods through Brahma, Yadu Shupa Janyatam, you should empower different entities like your portions to take birth on earth in the Yadu dynasty. In the Yadu dynasty, and of course the Pandavas are examples. The Pandavas, although they take birth technically in the Kuru dynasty, or the Bharata dynasty, all of their human DNA is uh, from the Yadu dynasty, their mother, uh, Queen Kunti, is a Yadavi princess and their father's demigod. So actually all their human DNA is from the Yadus. But then one of the great demons, Kalanemi, a friend of Viprachiti, Kalanemi takes birth in that dynasty and takes it over, takes over that Yadu dynasty. And of course Kalanemi takes birth as Kangsa. So, and then in the Kuru dynasty, Duryodhana takes birth. So. Um, because of this invasion of the earth, Krishna comes down, he brings all these powerful souls from higher planets or from the spiritual world and uh, to fight the demons. But once the war is over, once uh, Krishna and his devotees have defeated the demons, these powerful devotees like the Yadus cannot stay in the earth just like federal troops can't remain in a city after the terrorist danger has been, uh, has been nullified. And that's what Krishna says. That, that's a, a theme in the Bhagavatam you see over and over again that the Yadus themselves will become a burden to the earth. Because, for example, again, let's say some city is invaded, so it's, it's a terrible threat. So federal troops come in. But after the danger is over, if those federal troops aren't withdrawn, 
they themselves will become a threat to freedom and to civil society. So therefore, Krishna decided to withdraw his dynasty. And you could say, why did he do it the way he did? Well, for one thing, because no one could defeat the Yadus. They could only kill each other. No one else could kill them. Uh, and Krishna didn't just want to poison the city water supply in Dwarka. You know, that's kind of not a classy way to do things. So they were, they were warriors. And if you think about it, why were they drunk? Well, first of all, because they wouldn't have done it if they weren't drunk. And second of all, when you're drunk, you don't really know what's happening. You're, you're as we say in English, out of it. You don't really understand what's going on. So it was sort of painless for them, and it happened very quickly. It was, you know, it was over. I mean, you know, the people that were killed were killed in a second. It was virtually painless. They didn't know what they were doing, and no one else could kill them, and they had to be removed. So if you add it all up, if you, if you consider everything, it's, you can see what, what Krishna did. Obviously, not the only way he could have done it. He could have done it millions of other ways, but that's the way he did it. So, uh, anyway, Uddhava knows what's happening. He knows what's going to go on. And uh, he, he knows that he's not going to see Krishna again. In, in this world, of course, he'll see Krishna again spiritually, the spiritual platform, but he knows in this world that it's ending, it's over. And there's, even though the devotees have eternal relationships with Krishna and continue to participate in his pastimes forever, still there is something poignant. There is something very poignant about the end of the Lord's uh, appearance in a particular world. For example, imagine a theater company. Imagine the actors and actresses are friends, but still, when the run of a particular play, let's say they've been on Broadway for years and now this is the last performance. I mean, the people aren't really dying. They're still going to be friends, but it's the end of a performance that's been running for many years. And so there is, there's a real poignancy about Krishna leaving this world, even though, of course, uh, Krishna is eternal and his devotees are eternal and so on. So that's another aspect uh, of this story. And, um, well, those are some of the basic points. I mean, perhaps if any of you, do we take questions in this format? Uh, maybe I'll, you can chat me the answer to that. Round okay, so why don't we take some questions? So when Krishna comes personally, how is it anyone and everyone can see him just like uh, the materialist only sees art, just stone or wood, so would ordinary people only see matter, not him personally? Otherwise, how can ordinary people see spirit, what to speak of, the Supreme Spirit? Uh, yeah, that's right. Krishna, first of all, when Krishna comes, uh, no one is on earth by mere coincidence. I mean, every human being, every animal, every bird, every insect has, uh, you know, is part of the program. So that's the first thing, that, that the no one just happens to be on earth when Krishna comes. And secondly, um, as this uh, devotee, whoever asked the question, indicated that, yeah, for example, Krishna is present in the deity form. And the deity really is Krishna. It's really Krishna. And yet when people uh, come into the temple or see the deity, perhaps in a Rathiyatra parade, if they are not uh, at all Krishna conscious or don't even have some piety about them, uh, then they just see, as it said, you know, stone or wood or whatever, and so when people saw Krishna, they saw a human being. Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita. Nam prakasha sarvasya. I do not reveal myself to everyone. Yoga maya samabrata. I am 
I'm covered by my yoga maya, my illusory potency. And Krishna actually says samavrita. Avrita means covered, and samavrita means completely covered. So yes, uh, but still, even those people are somehow were chosen to be in the program. But yes, uh, so therefore the, the world does not know Krishna. So they, I mean, the deity is Krishna, and people can't see it as Krishna. So similarly, uh, they can't really see him. So Krishna set a good example in today's verse. However, in much of his life, he set a bad example. Please explain. Okay. First of all, Krishna never really set a bad example. For example, uh, let's take the case of the Rasa dance, because even Parikshit Maharaj said he raised this very question. Parikshit, uh, <laughs> some more bad examples are coming in by chat. So taking the example of Rasa dance, it's in that pastime that Parikshit himself brought up this issue in the 10th canto and said that Krishna came to this world to teach and exemplify Dharma. So why did he engage in this sort of gross adharma of dancing with someone else's or other people's wives? And uh, the point here is that Krishna has to teach two things. He has to teach dharma, of course, but he also has to teach that he's God. People also need to know that. And if, and if, if they don't know that, uh, then they don't get it. So, therefore, Krishna does things that only Krishna can do uh, because he's teaching that I'm God. After all, if Krishna merely did what we do, like everything Krishna did was what we do, then he'd be teaching Dharma, but he wouldn't be teaching that he's God. So he teaches both things. And therefore, uh, Sukadeva Goswami, Shuka makes this very important distinction between following and imitation. And he gives criteria. He says that if the great souls do something and also tell you to do it, then you should follow them. Like for example, Prabhupada chanted Hare Krishna, he told us to chant Hare Krishna. But if the great souls do something but do not tell you to do it, then you can't imitate them. So that's the distinction between following and imitating and that distinction is made in the Bhagavatam when Parikshi raised this question uh, to Shuka, why Krishna engaged in the Rasa dance. As far as being a butter thief, uh, he was a little toddler. I mean, he was, he was like two years old or something. So I don't think anyone would consider that a, a you know, moral turpitude or really criminal behavior for like a, if a one or two year old steals a butter. Oh, I didn't read the purport. I apologize for that. I will read the purport. Purport. I thought I did. Somehow I got involved, and uh, that's not it. Let's see, where is it? Um, I'm gonna have to open it again. Okay, here we go. I can't remember if I did or not. To be honest, it's you know too much ecstasy. And now I can't find it, so I'll open it again. And we'll read the purport for Prabhupada uh, Bhagavatam 343. Um, all, okay, I think we didn't read it. All of, so I'll read the verse again. The personality of God at Lord Sri Krishna, after foreseeing the end of his family by his internal potency, went to the bank of the river Saraswati, sipped water, and did, you know, the Achman Upa, uh, Saraswati was Upasprisha, and sat down underneath a tree. Prabhupada says, all the above mentioned activities of the Yadu and Bojas were executed by the internal potency of the Lord because he wanted them to be dispatched to their respective abodes after he finished his mission of descent. And of course, the word for descent in Sanskrit is avatara. So these Yadus and Bojas were all his sons and grandsons and were given complete protection by the paternal affection of the Lord. How they could be vanquished in the Lord's presence is answered in this verse. Everything was done by the Lord himself. Swatmamaya. The Lord's family members were either incarnations of his plenary expansions or demigods 
from the heavenly planets, and thus before his departure, he separated them by his internal potency. Before being dispatched to their respective abodes, they were sent to the holy place of Pravasa, where they performed pious activities and took food and drink to their heart's content. It was then arranged for them to be sent back to their abodes so that others could see that the powerful Yadu dynasty was no longer in the world. In the previous verse, the word anugyata indicate, which literally means permitted, indic indicating that the whole sequence of events was arranged by the Lord is significant. These particular pastimes of the Lord are not a manifestation of his external energy or material nature. Such an exhibition of his internal potency is eternal, and therefore one should not conclude that the Yadus and Bojas died in a drunken state in an ordinary fratricidal war. Sri Jiva Goswami comments on these incidents as magical performances. In other words, what you see is not what you get. So that is the purport for that verse. Uh, any other question that we can help you with? Just curious. What would uh, devotee Kshatriyas drink liquor? Is that cool? Uh, well, I guess because nowadays there are no real Kshatriyas, so it's not really an issue. Um, if you look at the, if you look at the Mahabharata, or the, if you look at the Bhagavatam. Uh, there was liquor around, and it seems like sometimes people would take a little drink. That doesn't mean a devotee would. It's just like, let's say you're working in an office, and there's an office party and everybody's drinking. It doesn't mean a devotee in the office will drink. And so did Kshatriyas in general uh, eat meat and drink liquor? It seems they did. I mean, they hunted. They killed animals, and... Uh, and, they, and the animals would be offered. For example, the Bhagavatam, the fourth canto, talks about King Prachina Parishad, who was, just got, who was out of control killing animals and then had to be stopped. So, but saintly devotees uh, are always different. So, Maharani, Devi Dalsi, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you for listening. Uh, why is Uddhava pronounced as if there is a line over the A? Uddhava. Because, uh, I guess because Western devotees are, I think, somehow rather committed to sort of pronouncing everything wrong. To give an example, there's a <laughs> one common word. Um, Purnima, Gaur Purnima. Purna means full or complete, like Om Purnama Duck. And Purnima means the full moon. So, so there are three... Uh, vowels, three syllables in that word, and ISKCON devotees generally get all three wrong. It's actually long, short, long. Remember like, like in your school, like a line, then a little short sign, and then a line, so it's, it's da, 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 it's pur, nima, but then devotees say pur, nim. Anyway, so it's actually Purnima. You can't drop a long A at the end of the world, a word. You can't say Purnima. You can't call Radha Rod. I mean, you've got to say Radha. Rama is called Ram, but you can't call Radha Rod. So you can't drop a long A. Anyway, so we live in an imperfect world, but um, that's the reason. And thank you again, Maharani, for listening. So... Uh, Oh, I need to type fast. <laughs> so any other question? Someone is typing something? I can't tell. Oh, oh, okay. Someone is... Um... Okay, so uh, hang on there, everyone. Be a little patient. I can't say I'm patient, but you can be. And then uh, we have a question coming in. In the meantime, I guess I should give the weather, the weather, traffic, the news. 
Well, I guess in the meantime, I'll just say that I'm in Israel right now, and uh, I'm in a, a, a devotee community, a Scon community called Harish, wonderful devotees, and I encourage you all to get a chance uh, to visit this wonderful devotee community in Israel, the Harish community. And there's also another community of uh, Russian-Israeli devotees who are very sincerely serving in another part of Israel. Uh, okay, too difficult to ask. So, are there any other questions? If not, then um, I guess there aren't, which is obviously true if there aren't questions. And there aren't any questions. So again, uh, thank all of you. I, my, my sincere thanks to all of you who uh, were listening. Now something's coming in. Oh, it would have been much better if you could hear us. I agree. I, I, I'm very sorry I couldn't hear the devotees on the other end. I have no idea why that was the case, but somehow it was. Oh, Ichati. The word Ichati means he or she desires. And it's actually, I'll show you how to spell he or she desires. Oh, Ichati. Ichati. So, um, oh, I, I think perhaps whoever has a uh, together if anyone has like a pronunciation question, something like that, which may not be of general interest, just uh, write to me personally and I'll be happy to help you. So I guess if there aren't any questions, perhaps we'll end here. And uh, again, I'd like to sincerely thank everyone who participated. And uh, it was a pleasure having the chance to serve all of you. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you.